morning, everyone. We have a lot to cover today, including some important updates in our weekly data and modeling presentation. So I'm going to give some brief introductions and let our speakers cover the details. First, I'm pleased to have Dr. Beth Kirkpatrick from UVM Medical Center here with us to share some big news about Vermont's role in the work towards a vaccine for COVID-19. She'll talk about how the UVM Medical Center and the Vaccine Testing Center at UVM have been selected to take part in an ongoing vaccine trial. This is a testament to the Medical Center and the university's leadership and expertise and will allow Vermonters to contribute to the important work of vaccine development. As we covered last week, developing and distributing a safe, effective vaccine is essential to being able to manage this virus. Without the measures we've had to take over the last six months into returning to normal once it's been safely and widely distributed. I want to congratulate UVM and UVM Medical Center on taking this on. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Governor Scott. Um, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. Um, as the governor mentioned, uh, we're pleased to announce that the UVM Medical Center, in collaboration with the Larner College of Medicine and the Vaccine Testing Center, has been chosen to participate in a phase three trial uh, to evaluate a leading coronavirus vaccine candidate. This is the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, I want to just spend a second talking about three things, the national context, this vaccine, and a little bit about what's happening locally. Uh, I think you know that uh, nationally four coronavirus vaccines have begun into phase three trials with two more potentially starting by the end of the year. These vaccines have all successfully made it through the first several phases of human testing where safety is very emphasized as well as uh, looking at whether the vaccines make the immune response we wanted. Um, what we don't know yet is whether these vaccines work and how well they work to prevent the actual coronavirus illness. Um, so these are pivotal trials for us to get to the point that a vaccine or vaccines can be licensed and used in the broader population. Um, so just to be clear, this vaccine study we're about to talk about is not part of the distribution plan that Dr. Levine spoke about at the previous press conference. It's the step before that. Um, so these are very pivotal trials to get to FDA approval for vaccines. So the, uh, the vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that we'll be participating in was designed by Oxford University. About 10 to 15,000 people globally have received this vaccine already. Volunteers in this study will be followed for up to two years and the vaccine study is designed to prevent illness from the vaccine. The study itself will have 30,000 people in it and 80 sites in the United States. Here locally, we will be permitted to enroll at least 250 volunteers and it is a voluntary participation only. Um, it's important to know you can't get coronavirus from the vaccine. And it's also important to know that in no way, shape or form will we be giving coronavirus virus to any volunteer. Um, finally, it's important to know it is a placebo controlled trial meaning throughout the people enrolled in the study, a third will get a placebo, two thirds will get the vaccine. So locally, uh, we have a debt of gratitude to the UVM Medical Center for allowing us to set up a specific outpatient study just to be used for this trial. Um, importantly, this site will follow highly stringent coronavirus precautions. Uh, participation is completely voluntary and for those interested in participating, you go through a pretty rigorous screening process and the informed consent process, which uh, we spend a considerable amount of time with each person walking through the whole study, risks and benefits, so an individual can make an uh, uh, individual decision. I want to I wanna point out, as you may have heard, this study, as well as another vaccine study, were both temporarily held for symptoms that had come up in volunteers. The, this study, sim the symptomatology was in a woman in England, um, and what happened in both cases is that a very thorough FDA review, as well as an independent data safety monitoring board, spent an extraordinary amount of time looking at all the information to ask the questions whether the symptoms were related to the vaccine. And we're pleased to say that as of last Friday, this trial, as well as the other trial, are both reopened in the United States. 
quickly before I close, I just want to uh, uh, say a few more things. Who can participate in this trial? It needs to be people that can get that will get coronavirus illness. In Vermont, 25% of our population in this study will need to be over the age of 65. We also need to enroll folks who have stable chronic pre-existing medical conditions and those with occupational and social exposures to coronavirus, including healthcare workers, teachers, police, et cetera. Um, we will not be enrolling young, healthy people that will not have symptomatic coronavirus. We're highly committed to an inclusive study. Coronavirus disease has impacted greatly our black, indigenous, and people of color communities, and we want to make sure that we offer all information and opportunity for everyone to participate. Um, there will be a lot of information about this trial on the UVM Medical Center website, uh, as well as pre-screening questionnaires. And I want us to, uh, again, extend my thanks to Dr. John Brumstead, Dr. Steve Leffler at the Medical Center, and the teams there that have helped us set this trial up, um, Dr. President Garamella and Dean Page at the University of Vermont, as well as uh, Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelsell at the Health Commission uh, at the Department of Health and the entire state of Vermont. Uh, we're really looking forward to working with the community to help end the global pandemic, and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much. This is exciting news, and we look forward to watching the vaccine trial progress. Next, we have the Secretary of State joining us by video today to give an overview of what in-person voting will look like next Tuesday. As you know, Vermont made it easy to vote by mail, and we've seen about 200,000 Vermonters take advantage thus far. But we know there are still many Vermonters who will vote in person next Tuesday. It's important we understand how to do it safely. I want to thank the Secretary of State's office for working with the Department of Health and our restart team and for being here to give us a preview of the guidance. And I'll now turn it over to Secretary Condos. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, and good morning, everyone. I'm excited to announce by the end of the day yesterday, we had over 208,000 Vermonters who had already voted early safely and securely. That number represents about two-thirds of the total number of votes that were cast in the last presidential election in 2016. When this pandemic first hit Vermont last winter, we had no idea what path it would take in the months leading up to this coming uh, election. Based on what we heard from state and national health experts and from the governor, only one thing was certain. We needed to plan for the worst. Since we began planning in March for how to conduct elections safely during a global pandemic and public health crisis, we have done so with two unwavering goals. We wanted to preserve the voting rights of every eligible Vermont voter, and two, to protect the health and safety of not only our voters, but also our town clerks and, and their election workers. In order to accomplish these goals, it was necessary to do what we could to reduce high traffic in-person voting at the polls on election day. To accomplish this for the November general election, we used a mail ballot to every active registered voter. The numbers above speak for themselves, but the bulk of the credit does not go to my office or the legislature or to the town clerks. It goes to Vermonters, whom I would like to thank for overwhelmingly embracing the safe, secure voting options available to them during these challenging times. For many, though, the voting process this year may feel new and unfamiliar. So it is important for us to discuss what options are still available to those who have not yet cast their ballots, as well as what measures are in place to make sure that anyone who votes in person next Tuesday can do so safely. If you have not yet voted, you still have options. You can drop off your ballot at your town clerk's office during normal business hours any day that they are open before election day. You can drop it off in a secure ballot drop box at their town offices. And on our website, you can check the listing of where those ballot boxes are located. Uh, or, you can contact your, or you can contact your clerk to uh, find out where they have their drop box or mail slot for ballots. 
or you can bring your ballot with you to the polling place on election day right up until 7 p.m. If you prefer to vote in person, all polling places will be open and in-person voting can be done safely with few, uh, a few extra precautions to help protect our friends, neighbors, and poll workers. It may look a little different than what you're used to, but Vermonters have once again shown their resilience by adapting to the safety measures necessary to protect ourselves and others as much as possible when in the public area. For many weeks now, we've been working hard with our town clerks and in consultation with the Department of Health to make sure that voters who want to show up and vote can feel as comfortable and safe as possible. We've developed polling place guidelines in consultation with the Department of Health following CDC's best practices to ensure safe voting on election day. This guidance can be found on our website at sos.vermont.gov. Election workers will also be health screened prior to working on election day. Names, contact information, and shift times for all poll workers must be recorded in order to enable contact tracing if necessary. We have provided all towns with infection prevention kits and sterilization supplies. We've given them the PPE they need to keep their election workers and voters safe, including face masks, face shields, gloves, along with lots of sanitizing wipes and hand sanitizer. We'd like to remind voters to bring a few things with you if you can when you vote next Tuesday. Bring your ballot if you still have it. Bring a black ink pen, not a Sharpie, and bring a mask. If you forget and don't have any one of those, that's okay. You're still going to be able to vote, and no voter will be denied their right to cast a ballot. Poll workers will have extra masks, pens, and ballots on hand. If you do not have the ballot you were mailed, you will be asked to fill out an affidavit stating that you have not already voted that, that ballot and that, that was mailed to you. If you have any questions about the voting process between now and Election Day, I encourage you to reach out to your town clerk. Vermont town clerks are our election superheroes and I and have been working incredibly hard to keep the front doors of our democracy open for Vermonters during this pandemic. Please make sure you thank them while you're at it. I know I will. While we have yet to return to any sense of normalcy that we have all been hoping for, we can take comfort and pride in the fact that the wheels of our Vermont democracy will keep on turning. Again, I want to thank all Vermonters for their commitment to voting. We are leading the nation in early voting and are poised to bring break previous turnout records with continued early voting this week and in-person voting on Election Day. Again, here in Vermont, you still have options. You can vote early, you can vote at the polls on Election Day, and you can vote with confidence that the proper steps have been taken to ensure in-person voting will be conducted as safely as possible. We're exactly one week away from Election Day, Vermonters, so it is time to get out there and vote using whatever option you decide is best for you. I'm going to finish with a shameless plug to the media listening in right now. I announced this morning that we will be holding a virtual media availability tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. to discuss questions on this topic and also on the directive addendum which we issued yesterday regarding safe election procedures. So if you need to, please reach out to my chief of staff, Eric Covey, so you can get the details you need to attend. So thanks very much. Get out there and vote. Well, thank you, Secretary Condos, and uh, your teams for all your efforts. And as Secretary Condos has said, uh, if you have further questions, uh, you can attend his press conference tomorrow at 11, I believe he said. Before turning it over to Commissioner Pichak and Dr. Levine, I have a few additional announcements. First, as you may have seen, we announced some changes to recreational sports guidance yesterday in response to hockey-related outbreaks here in Vermont and in our neighboring states. While these changes may be challenging, this will add more layers of protection so we can continue to operate these programs here in Vermont, while other states have suspended theirs. You can view the updated guidance at accd.vermont.gov, but it includes limiting recreation leagues to in-state only, meaning everything must occur in Vermont with Vermont-only teams. It also tightens the policies for spectators and social gatherings around these sports. 
Which brings me to my next update. As you may have also heard over the last week, the ripple effect of the outbreak here in Central Vermont has impacted several schools, workplaces, and healthcare settings across the state. On Friday, we'll be presenting more details on how this spread and why. But it's important to note that we believe this began with a group gathering and not from play on the ice itself. Getting together without taking precautions, including mask wearing and distancing, or not following the travel guidance appear to be a common denominator in what we're, we've been seeing over the last few weeks. And I want to be clear, this is travel by Vermonters, not out-of-state visitors. I hope everyone will think about this as we approach Halloween this Saturday, because we need everyone to be smart about any gatherings you go to. Ask yourself, will people be wearing masks? Is there enough room to spread out? Has everyone been following the travel guidance? If the answer to any of these questions is no, you should consider skipping it because it may not be worth the risk. With cases and hospitalizations growing across the country and cases growing here in Vermont as well, it's so important we do what we can to limit the risk to ourselves and others. By doing so, we can keep our schools and businesses open. We just need to use a little bit of common sense. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichek, whose latest modeling will show why it's so important to stay vigilant. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to start with a discussion about the recent uptick in our cases uh, here in Vermont, uh, and then turn to some comparisons between what we're seeing at the national level and what's happening in Vermont with some important contrasts as well. Also contrasting what's happening currently in Vermont uh, with what happened uh, earlier in the pandemic uh, in, in the spring. We'll then turn to some more Vermont specific data looking at our forecast, uh, looking at flu vaccine updates and education updates, and then finish with a discussion about the regional travel uh, and an update to the travel map. So if we can go to the first slide, you'll see um, they're really are three periods of, of accelerated growth that we've experienced during the pandemic. One back in the spring, what we've dubbed the spring, the spring peak. One around the Winooski outbreak uh, in early part of June. And then more recently, um, the last two, week or so. So certainly uh, each one of these um, upticks mirrors each other to some degree in terms of how quickly cases were going up. There's some important contrast that we'll make in a minute. Uh, but a couple of things that are a little more concerning about the more recent upticks, as the governor pointed out, there are a number of threads to outbreaks. There are a number of different outbreaks occurring now. Uh, that's certainly in contrast to the Winooski outbreak over the summer. Similarly, we started that recent uptick in cases with a little bit higher base um, in the last couple of weeks as compared, obviously, to the first peak uh, and to what happened uh, in Winooski as well. So those are the points of comparison that I think are important, but we'll also bring out some contrast in a minute that's equally important for Vermonters to keep in mind. I think to do that, it's helpful to look at what's happening at the national level and then compare that to what's happening here in Vermont. So we'll do that both with our case growth and positivity rate, our hospitalizations, and then our death rates uh, nationally and in Vermont. So as you can see at the national level, case growth continues to go up. Uh, cases have really been accelerating uh, over the last number of weeks. It's not just a matter of testing. You can see that the positivity rate has also gone up from just over 4% to above 6% over the last few weeks at the national level. Again, indicative of more virus circulating across the country. If we compare that to our Vermont numbers, I both want to make the comparison to the national data and to the earlier peak that we saw in the spring. You can see that case growth certainly has increased. But our positivity rate remains very low compared to the national level, just about 1% over the last seven days, again, compared to over 6% nationally. And if you look at the positivity rate recently compared to earlier in the pandemic, uh, when we were approaching numbers over 10, 15%, very different situation than earlier in the pandemic. So even though the cases are rising as they are, that's an important uh, piece of context for Vermonters to keep in mind. Similarly, on hospitalizations, you can see that hospitalizations are going up again nationally, both 
general hospitalizations and ICU hospitalizations. Again, that's indicative of more virus circulating across the country, not simply more cases for more testing. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But again, contrast that to what we're seeing in Vermont. Even with our cases going up, our hospitalization levels have stayed very low in Vermont, both from uh, general hospitalization and from the ICU. And that trend has really occurred uh, since early June and maintained uh, throughout this entire period. So that's something uh, important for Vermonters to keep in mind, remembering that hospitalizations are a delayed indicator, but those numbers are staying very low, which is important. Last, nationally, deaths did start to creep up over the last few weeks, unfortunately. Hopefully those will tail down as the country gets case growth controlled. Um, but again, an important contrast to Vermont, uh, we haven't had a death uh, since July 28th. We are the lowest per capita um, fatality rate in the country. This is all continuing to be very positive sound news for us uh, as it relates to these three important comparisons. Another comparison I want to make, though, which is not as favorable for Vermont, is where the case growth is happening. One of the points we've made uh, the last number of weeks is that this third peak is occurring not necessarily in one localized region of the country, but is more spread out across the country into the south, midwest, the Great Plains. And that's a similar theme that we're seeing a little bit here in Vermont as well. Uh, this week, for example, measured from Tuesday to, to uh, Monday, was the first week that we had a, count, a case in every single one of Vermont's 14 counties. Uh, that hasn't happened previously on this same pattern. And we're seeing count cases spread out uh, in a little bit more of a way than we have previously uh, during uh, the pandemic. That all leads us to our most updated forecast, and I think there's some really important points to drive home here. One, you can see where we are on our actual seven-day average, and then you can see where we were just six days ago, that yellow dotted line, showing a pretty mild increase in cases over the next six weeks. With just six days of high case growth, we're now on a very different trajectory. So again, some important things to keep in mind. One. Just as quickly as that trajectory went up, we can get it to go down again based on our own individual actions that we partake in over the next few weeks. We certainly have control over this in Vermont. It's in our own hands to make that forecast not a reality. This has happened numerous times in the past where case growth has gone up, our forecasts have gone up, but Vermonters have responded um, and those cases have gotten back down under control. So that's certainly something that we are hoping to see again here over the next three or four weeks in anticipation of holidays later in the month and next month as well. One point I want to make, and Dr. Levine will emphasize this more relating to Vermont, is that we're seeing cases grow going up in every part of our travel region, in every state and district in the District of Columbia in our travel region, and every state has called out specifically small gatherings. The weather has become colder, uh, not as nice as it was in the summertime. People are moving indoors. People are having smaller gatherings. Every single jurisdiction around us, as Dr. Levine will talk about this in Vermont, has called out these small gatherings as partly why they're seeing increases in their state. So important to keep in mind here in Vermont uh, to protect yourselves, your family, or communities, even if you're going inside to maintain those um, different health guidelines that Dr. Levine always talks about, physical distancing, masks, uh, and good ventilation as well. Those restart metrics that we always talk about week after week, they're all trending favorably, even though we're seeing this increased case growth. The only thing we want to point out this week uh, on the next slide is the sustained growth rate. We're not seeing the kind of sustained growth rate that would give us concern, but it is different now than it's been pretty much at any other point during the pandemic, but for early on in that first peak in the Winooski rise. So something that we're keeping a close eye on, but syndromic surveillance remains low. I mentioned our positivity rate remains low. Hospitalization capacity remains strong uh, as well. Quickly touching on the flu data, you'll see really good news here, a, a continued high uptake of Vermonters getting the flu vaccine. You can see we're 38% to our goal for this year. Vermonters are ahead of where they were this time last year by about 13%. So that's really good news. And again, this is important to make sure we have as much hospital capacity as we can as we get into the flu season in case we do see a rise in a continued increase in, in COVID cases and hospitalizations. Looking quickly at the different age brackets, you'll see that those that are younger continue to do well. Those that are older continue to outpace last year as well. 
while those in that 20 to 30 year old range uh, are, pace, are, are not as uh, well as they were doing last year. So want to continue to encourage them to get a flu shot and everybody as well. Looking at uh, the education update, we see that Vermont has uh, 25 cases reported this morning in schools, in 19 different schools. Uh, so something that is different than past weeks, we actually are seeing an increase here. So something that we want to um, pay close attention to. But when compared to New Hampshire and Maine, very different story. Similarly, on our, edu on our uh, higher ed data, same sort of story. Uh, we're seeing an increase largely from St. Michael's, but much better than when compared to New Hampshire and to Maine. Looking regionally, we are seeing cases go up in the region, up 21% this week, so certainly a big increase. And skipping ahead a, a few slides to the updated travel map, you will see the impact in our travel region. Only two counties have improved, 15 counties worsened, now only uh, 880,000 people are eligible to travel to Vermont. Nine states don't have a single green county uh, in our travel map district. And you can see where those cases are getting better and worsening on the next slide, mostly in the Northeast, uh, and just some very slight improvement uh, in Pennsylvania. So with that, I will turn it over to the Dr. Levine. So what we've heard this morning is certainly notable for a very significant reason. Vermont has started to experience multiple simultaneous outbreaks. Now, earlier this year, we had an outbreak that was mostly in Winooski and Burlington. Later on, one from Fairhaven, and more recently, the Champlain Orchards and others. Those were cases that, for the most part, were among a relatively small and well-defined community cohort group. What we've been experiencing recently are different outbreaks among relatively unrelated groups and individuals spreading from the original cases to their contacts and contacts of those contacts, crossing situations and geographic regions of the state. And there are several such events happening at once. So this is really a wake-up call for us all. And remember, this isn't all data. These are real people, you, me, our family, fellow Vermonters. My review of these outbreaks um, is, is as follows. Modest sized gatherings with familiar faces, often food and drink, so no masks, for a prolonged time, playing a role just when someone was at that right point, that infectious phase, of their infection. In some cases, it's probable, but not certain, as the governor discussed, that travel was involved. Either guests arriving without quarantine or Vermonters leaving the state and returning with an exposure that they were unaware of. Because of you, as you've just seen, the nation and even the immediate region could be labeled as dangerous right now. And some of you may have noted a sports theme, but keep in mind, it's not the playing of the sport that's been the issue. It's the team activities that precede or follow the sport, whether they be social or things like carpooling, things off the playing field and off the ice. I'm concerned that a number of our uh, schools, a growing number, are being impacted. And I just wanted to... Um, show the sort of curve of what we're dealing with first here. The blue items are the initial outbreak related to the uh, Memorial Civic Center in Montpelier. As we move into the darker green area, those are more what we call the secondary infections. And as you can see, the blue are decaying off at that point. Now we have the darker green decaying off and the lighter green tertiary infections. Many of these people are on the tertiary side are people who were quarantined already because they were contacts. And this is the only other slide I'm going to show today talking about 
how the initial outbreak has led to my concern about the schools and other places. So we can see that an initial outbreak that the most up-to-date number is 17 individuals, all in that earlier part of the graph, has now morphed into several workplaces and a number of schools and a major uh, college in the area with the caseloads that are identified on there. I'm particularly concerned about the schools because providing our kids with the education and related school experiences they need has been a steep challenge. But our schools, the teachers, staff, administrators, families, have all moved mountains to provide our kids with great programming under uniquely difficult circumstances. And fortunately, most have not had to close or interrupt too many classes. However, you can imagine how disruptive and stress-producing this has been to all involved. And I empathize with all who have expressed that to us before. While it is the adults more than the children who have been the cases, numerous students still have had to be quarantined or had to have their classes go remote. So some key messages today. I agree with the slide that Commissioner Pichek had up from uh, abundant other states, because the bottom line is that small gatherings can have a big impact. Something I want everyone to keep in mind as the holidays approach and as you make your plans. Something Dr. Burks stressed with us from her experience traveling throughout the Midwest and Plain states that were having particular problems. Now, the state of Vermont, of course, has very specific guidance in place. And as the year went on, the governor has opened up the state at an appropriate pace, which means there's a lot we can do every day in our lives. Go shopping, getting together with friends, with family, participating in sports activities, the list goes on. But, and this is a key point, what you can do is not always what you should do. And that goes to, again, assessing your comfort level. Before the pandemic, if I were to talk to our interpreter here and get too close and in his face, he would say I'm invading his personal space. Now, at a time of a pandemic, if somebody's closer than six feet to us, I think we notice that even more readily. So if we know we're inserting ourselves into circumstances that might make that happen with greater frequency, we should take our own pulse and understand that that's an important thing that we've recognized. And again, if we're invited to a gathering, we might ask how many will be there? Where will it be? What kind of setting are you going to? And assess your comfort level with crowded spaces, with will people be wearing masks reliably? Will there be room in that area for people to distance? Will the ventilation be adequate? Now, we know winter is not a great season when it comes to infectious diseases. That's why this time of year is also the flu season. So I have to again remind everyone to make our flu vaccine rate approach the early voting rate in Vermont. Doing that between now and Election Day would be a really positive sign. It's also the time of year to be together through the shorter days and get together for the holidays. And I know that we have to make difficult choices at this time. Now, you have to make your own decisions about what to do, whether it's on a weekend, whether it's for a recreational activity, whether it's for Thanksgiving or even Halloween. Like other aspects of our lives, if Halloween doesn't look different this year, if Thanksgiving and Christmas don't look different this year, then perhaps we're not approaching them correctly because everything we do in our lives this year has looked different in our attempt to keep everything as safe as possible. So this means I would start your considerations by assuming you should limit your plans. My advice as a health commissioner and as a doctor is that it's best to not travel at this time. Travel increases your chance of getting and spreading the virus. Staying home may be the best way to protect yourself and others. My advice is also that the dinner table should not be so large 
and filled with multiple households, friends, family from other locales. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't pass the common sense test during a pandemic. As for trick-or-treating, I am fully in favor of trick-or-treating. Six-foot spaces, masks on faces, avoid crowded places. If you're going out, definitely wear your mask, the ones that you wear to the store. Make sure the kids wear them as well. And you can find a fun way to make those masks a fun part of their costume. Again, avoiding crowds, avoiding indoor parties and large gatherings. If you're trick-or-treating and one street or neighborhood seems especially busy, skip to the next one. Maybe the candy hall will be good. And maybe if it's not too busy, you'll even get a better haul. And if you're going around with children uh, to chaperone them in trick-or-treating, make sure it's a smaller family and family and friend unit and not a large crowd. And if you're on the opposite end handing out the candy, I've heard lots of people already in my own neighborhood talk about using a table as a sort of separator so that the candy can be placed on the table but all the usual camaraderie and observations of the kids' costumes and everything can occur still uh, without having a very close face-to-face -face transaction, if you will. Like with everything else that we want to do, we can find a way to enjoy, follow the guidance, and act as we should, and that's how we can bend the curve. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll open up to questions at this time. Okay, just a reminder, we have 22 people in the queue and an hour and 15 minutes. So starting in the room, Calvin. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, I think this question is probably for Dr. Kirkpatrick, um, dealing with the, uh, the new vaccine trial. I'm just wondering, you know, specifically, why Vermont? I mean, what, what about whether it be UVM Medical Center or, you know, is there a case prevalence or caseload? What, why have we been selected? There's a um, thanks for the question. There's a there's a few region a few few reasons. I think um, probably three or four I can think of. Uh, the first is that um, the the research group here, the vaccine testing center, has the experience to run a trial of this complexity and size. The second is these uh, vaccine trials need to be represented proportion uh, regionally, um, and so we do need regional representation. Uh, the third uh, reason is. Um, particularly in Vermont, we have an older population and the vaccines are really important to show that they're safe and effective in those populations. Um, I think those are the key reasons. Um, now let me let me stop with that. And I just have a, a secondary question for Governor Scott. Um, yes, we probably heard UVM's leadership is announcing or proposing a uh, freeze on tuition and room and board if approved. This would be the third year in a row for um, tuition. Um, as sitting on the Board of Trustees, I'm wondering what sort of factors you and others will take into account, uh, especially given potential concerns from um, faculty. Well, again, I think it's, uh, I applaud UVM for taking this approach. I think during uh, these times, during um, economic uncertainty, uh, this is just exactly what we need to be doing. So. Again, I have a lot of faith in uh, uh, President Garamella and uh, his staff and, and his reasoning behind this. And I think that, again, it will protect the university uh, in the future. It's almost like uh, investing in the university now so that uh, when we come out of this pandemic, we'll be in better shape. So I, I believe it's the right approach. Um, obviously, uh, he has a plan uh, put together uh, that will be uh, put to, to the, uh, to the uh, board. And, um, and, uh, and I'm sure that we'll have some, inc um, some good discussions about, about how uh, effective it'll be. Mary, I guess just a quick follow up. Are you concerned about the potential it's still seven, maybe million dollars shortfall of the cost? I, I think I'm more concerned uh, about losing more enrollment. And, uh, and I think that what we've seen, you know, with a lot of colleges in the Northeast, smaller colleges, uh, albeit, what we're seeing with the Vermont State College system, uh, and it's all about enrollment, uh, protecting the, en the enrollment, uh, making sure that you have uh, a, uh, um, an attractive uh, kind of approach 
uh, and, and a lot of that uh, surrounds affordability. So uh, again, I think it's the exact approach we need to be taking in this, at this, moment, at this moment in time. Ross. Governor, I was wondering if I could ask you about winter sports this year, uh, especially with the, the update yesterday on the um, things like club hockey leagues and things like that. If seeing this develop over the last three weeks has maybe changed the thinking around how we're approaching planning for the winter sports season. Yeah, it's always been about the how, right? Um, what we're seeing right now, what we just experienced with the with the outbreak, uh, with the Sun for Mop facility, uh, I believe was everything around the hockey. It wasn't on the ice, it was off the ice, uh, social gatherings and so forth, carpooling. Um, so we're going to have to tighten that up. We're going to be more aware of what we're doing uh, and make sure that we continue to be able to provide uh, for that recreation, um, but uh, make sure that we're not uh, um, um, causing some un other undue uh, repercussions as a result. So uh, again, uh, we'll be looking at the how uh, as we move forward uh, to the winter season and uh, determining whether we have to put further restrictions in place. But I want to be strategic about it. You know, I, I don't want to roll back uh, some of the initiatives that we've taken thus far. I think tightening up our policies making sure that we've got the gaps filled. Uh, and uh, again, it's in our hands. Each and every one of us has a role to play in this because we're the ones uh, who can wear a mask, keep socially distant, um, physically distant, and, uh, and make sure we wash our hands and just do all the things we've been talking about over the last few months. And if we can get back to that, I think we've gotten a little bit complacent. We've let our guard down and we're seeing the effects of that, but we can, we can counter that. School administration have made a few uh, statements about the contact tracing that's gone on, and that it seems that at least uh, the genesis of some of those cases seem to be one or more students breaking the school's coronavirus policies. I'm curious if you can share anything that you know about the contact tracing, what it's shown, and uh, maybe even a, a message to students and anyone in the school community about what can be done to prevent future outbreaks like this. Sure. Um, so. In this particular outbreak, as I alluded to in my comments, uh, there was a social gathering, but um, I've not been convinced that the social gathering uh, was beyond the norms that were allowed uh, at the college. Um, but obviously, a social gathering involves sometimes sacrificing that physical distance and that masking, especially if food and drink are involved. Um, but I, I do know that many of the cases are in the same social network, as you might expect, um, even on a college campus. That's how that works. Um, and again, I'm not convinced that there's any major um, offense that occurred, if you will. Um, there have been concerns raised about uh, if, if students that are supposed to be quarantining were quarantining effectively. And uh, I'll have to let the college speak to that more, more clearly. But uh, that would be my only concern. Should schools rethink what their approved social gathering guidelines are if something like this is happening within the guidelines? They should always be rethinking that. But again, if their gatherings are a 10, 10 person limit, um, that's getting pretty strict. Uh, one could get stricter than that uh, for sure. I, I will say that um, the college's response has been quite admirable in how they've approached things. Uh, they do have sufficient facilities to allow for isolation of cases and for quarantine of contacts. Um, they are able to provide for those students who are uh, finding themselves in those situations. They've gone remote with classes. All athletics have been canceled for the time being. Um, it's essentially a quarantine campus, and um, I think they're all behaving very res responsibly at this point in time. And they're going to continue on a testing protocol uh, as we continue to try to make sure we're trying to contain as much of this as we can and uh, discern if there's any other cases that develop over time. Thank you. Uh, since Dr. Levine's up there, Dr. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, guy, the feds just uh, announced that they've uh, released a lot of uh, 
antigen tests. Uh, Vermont getting, I think, over 180,000 of them. Um, your response, what, what are we going to do with those? Are you going to put them to work right away? Or is this uh, an ongoing sort of strategic kind of uh, stockpiling of them? That's exactly how I would describe it. Is <laughs> we are actually strategically planning to how to utilize them. They were actually sent with the key purpose of being long-term care facility directed, uh, creating a sort of rapid network of testing at those facilities, uh, which is a fine use for them, as I've said in the past, using them on a periodic, no less than weekly basis uh, in the same population over and over again. So that one turns positive, that becomes a real sentinel event that you should pay attention to. We actually have uh, an adequate testing regime with PCR in those institutions that will carry us through the rest of this calendar year. So as we're strategically planning for the next year, it might involve actually implementing using these in a more robust way. The only thing that we have in the back of our mind as a reservation is can we obtain continued supply? Uh, will the manufacturer be able to put out enough so that there's a replacement supply for what we use up because they'll get used rather quickly if you're using them on a weekly basis. Um, there's also an opportunity that the government would do what they did this time, which is uh, work with the manufacturers, purchase another large bulk volume that they can distribute to the states and allay our concerns that there wouldn't be a uh, follow-up uh, test to do because we would have it already supplied. So those are the factors going into play. Um, plus, we uh, still could be utilizing those in outbreak settings. I'm uh, hoping we're not developing you know, abundant more outbreaks, but if we did, outbreak settings are sometimes a good place to use antigen tests. If the prevalence in a certain community is going up, uh, you can use the test and get a rapid turnaround and, and uh, have the appropriate disposition for the people that are tested on a very rapid basis if they need to isolate. Um, Governor, I, I guess it's my turn to ask the question, but I, <laughs> are you, uh, have you come to a decision on uh, how you're voting this time around, uh, both in person and then for perhaps president? Yeah, I have, uh, have not. Um, I'll be voting sometime between now and Tuesday. I don't know whether I'll be doing it on Tuesday in person or whether I'll be doing delivering my ballot to the uh, town clerk, but, um, but I haven't made a decision at this point. Very good. All right, moving to the phones. Lisa Loomis, the Valerie Porter. Can I just back oh, up? Just sorry. other than the obvious uh, that I won't be voting for President Trump. I just want to make sure that's clear. Go All ahead. Right. <laughs> Lisa Writing Loomis. Lisa Loomis, the Valerie Porter. Good morning. Thank you all. I'd like to follow up on a question asked last Friday about an outbreak in Waterbury and Duxbury that may be associated with the American Legion Hall in Waterbury. We've received multiple, multiple reports from readers in these towns about a gathering in that hall where one of the staff was positive and exposed some of the guests. Secretary Smith. Lisa, um, the only thing that I know about that case is um, there were two cases uh, that were uh, reported on that. I know that contact tracing is, uh, is examining that case right now, but I don't have an update unless Dr. Levine has, a, Dr. Levine doesn't have an update as well. Um, I, I've known of uh, two cases so far. Thank you very much. And then as a quick follow-up, this is probably for Dr. Levine. Um, we're getting questions from parents whose college kids want to come home to ski on weekends. And some of these kids are college kids who are getting tested twice a week. Can kids consume the negative PCR tests that are 72 or fewer hours old use their college ski passes to stay in the homes of their Vermont families? I hope they're not planning on skiing this weekend. <laughs> yes, that would be very nice. I think that would be challenging uh, from looking at the mountains right now. 
Um, so again, we always say that the day you have a negative test is the day you had a negative test. It, it is not unfortunately predictive of the next day or the day after the day after. So I would submit that if you're coming from a zone that has uh, higher prevalence, which most of the map, as you saw, shows, um, it doesn't really matter if you had a 72-hour test uh, that was negative because you could still be incubating the virus and be at your pre-symptomatic phase during that 48 hours when you can transmit virus. And indeed, I think that some of the um, larger uh, social gatherings that have occurred in Vermont uh, have actually played out in that way, where potentially people who might have been asked to quarantine but weren't quarantined and came from out of state uh, were present in a large crowd. So I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's um, not the way our quarantine policy actually works. Thank you. That will disappoint some parents, but better to have the cold hard truth, I suppose. Lisa, I just want to uh, amend. I, I've read uh, that we have two cases. I don't see it on my EPI report, uh, but I have read in the media that there's two cases at the American Legion, but it is not on my EPI report. So does that, what does that mean? It's just the EPI report is not updated, or? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I would. I will get back to you, Lisa, to get an update on where that is right now. Great, thank you very much. And I can echo that, but I wanted to add to my other report that um, parents should be concerned that when their college students come home, forget about quarantine for skiing, but when they come home because it's time to come home after the fall semester, that if they're coming from a part of the country that would have high prevalence of virus, even if they've been through a testing program, the college students should quarantine at home if they're going to be spending time in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Ledbetter. NBC5. Thank you. Um, there's some confusion based on our email about this travel map and what it means, what it does. It's been a long time since we've seen one that looks this bad. And so I'm wondering if you can clarify what is permitted for travel over our state border, particularly to the commercial areas in the Upper Valley and Plattsburgh. Mr. Pichet. Uh, thank you, Stuart. And yeah, this is the lowest the uh, uh, map has ever been in terms of the number of people that can enter without a quarantine. So that's uh, for certain. Um, in terms of what can happen in terms of essential travel, there is a specific paragraph on the ACCD website that goes into more detail. But it is things like uh, travel for work, uh, travel for uh, groceries, for food, uh, things like traveling for your own medical care, traveling for the medical care of others, traveling for school, whether that's K through 12 or college. So it's really a, a lot of the things that are essential to somebody's daily life uh, and not those things that are more leisure travel focused. It's also true, Mike, that Jensen County would be bright red too if that were the color we used for Vermont counties. Yeah, so um, it's a good point, Stuart, that we haven't made this in, in a while, but we made the intentional decision to exempt Vermont from the travel policies way back in June because we have a much more granular understanding of our own uh, uh, information, of our own data, of our own cases. We have more confidence in our testing capacity, our test turnaround, our contact tracing capacity. So we focus on a lot of different metrics to sort of view Vermont and use the 400 per million as a proxy for risk for all of those other counties you know, across the region, which total over 500. All right, and one uh, quick question for the governor. Um, the administration announced on Friday that September revenues uh, were way up in all three funds. The general fund was 20, 34%. And year to date through three months, you are way ahead. What does that tell you? And does that 
give you any comfort as you begin to think about next year's budget? Well, it certainly is uh, positive news um, that we're in a, the position we're in at this point in time. Um, but I'm still concerned uh, about the future. Uh, we still need more corona, uh, corona uh, virus relief funds uh, from the federal government. There should be a stimulus package that Congress should be working on right now. Um, and uh, because if they don't, it could be after sometime late January before anything comes out. And uh, so this is uh, part of the ripple effect of some of the economic packages we've been able to issue uh, over the last uh, six, seven months. And uh, I think we're seeing the benefit of that. Uh, but that will, you know, wane off uh, over uh, the next uh, month or two uh, without some more relief. So, again, good news for us right now, uh, but I don't think this is uh, ongoing. Uh, I think that we'll see that as the winter season uh, approaches uh, with the coronavirus uh, uh, exceeding uh, the uh, levels that we've seen over the last six months region-wise, uh, this will have an effect, uh, a more uh, negative effect on our hospitality sector than before. So I'm still very, very concerned about the future economic uh, um, um, situation here in Vermont. Thanks. Mike Donahue, Global News. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, Governor, uh, many Vermont businesses, especially up in the Champlain Islands, <coughs> have sort of went through this summer tourist season. Uh, you've been offering grants and programs. So I'm wondering what you have up your sleeve for those businesses as they head into the winter season and the sharp downturn in the economy that they routinely face. Uh, I guess the question is how will they still be above water come next spring? Yeah, as you know, Mike, we've been focusing on allowing or, or helping um, prop up some of these businesses over the last few months uh, so they can survive uh, until we get out of this, uh, the situation we find ourselves in with the pandemic. Um, we, um, we are at this point in time, uh, every, every dollar of uh, corona, uh, coronavirus relief funds and CARES Act money uh, we've received thus far need to be expended uh, by the guidelines put in, in effect by the, uh, the feds by 1231. So we are going through all those programs at this point to see if there's any unspent money that isn't going to be spent before the end of the end of the year. And if there isn't, uh, we want to put them to good use to help some of these uh, these businesses survive throughout the winter. Uh, because again, when we we find our, our way out of this, uh, there is a uh, an effective uh, um, vaccine that is put into place that's safely and widely distributed. Uh, then we'll see uh, the benefits of having the structure in place, that we still have our economy, uh, still have the foundation uh, that it had previous to uh, pre-COVID. Um, so um, that's our strategy. Uh, we're, we're looking for more funds and we're, um, you know, we're lobbying our congressional delegation and, and we're asking Congress to do the job and uh, help the states out. The other thing, uh, the uh, Lieutenant Governor's race appears to be the only place close statewide race. I'm just wondering your reaction uh, to uh, Democrat Molly Gray not willing to produce any sort of tax records that would prove she filed her tax returns in Vermont at the time over the last four or five years. I guess there's some question as to whether she was in Vermont or considered a Vermonter. And, uh, I'm sorry, a couple of leading Democrats who are missed and people are hard pressed to think of somebody not being willing to show their qualified support, are qualified for the job or, or maybe the qualifications to run for the job. Yeah, I, to be honest, uh, Mike, I haven't been following that race as closely as some, um, but I, I mean, I, I hear about uh, candidates not willing to produce their tax returns, but that has been on uh, the federal level uh, running for president, actually. So I didn't, I wasn't aware uh, that there was a problem in the lieutenant governor's race. So I don't, I don't know if I have any comment about that. Yeah, I'm not so sure if the tax return is much as 
just a letter from the tax department saying that she filed at, at the time she didn't file it within, you know, for, she didn't file her 2016 uh, this past year or something like that. that yeah, I, I'm just not filed on time. Yeah, not aware of the situation, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Greg, County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, a quick follow up and then a question. Uh, follow up on the announcement of the vaccine study. Uh, it was mentioned that about a third of the people that are going to take part in this vaccine study uh, would be given a placebo. Um, by my calculations, that's about 84 people. At the end of the study, will those people be notified that they were given a placebo so that they would have the opportunity to, to go get an actual vaccine? Yeah, I, I believe that is the case, but I'll let the experts answer. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a short answer, and the answer is yes. Um, the, at the end of the trial, those that receive the placebo will um, be notified and will be uh, eligible to be given the current vaccine. It's also worth noting that if another coronavirus vaccine comes out while this trial is running, um, as in any trial, um, volunteers are always able to leave the trial if they wanted to get one of the other vaccines. And it, this will end up in some of the complexity that I think um, Dr. Levine has spoken about previously, uh, what happens if we have several vaccines out. Um, at right now, I say that's kind of going to be a good problem to have. Um, but maybe that's more information for the specific question. So the answer to the specific question is yes. And what's the duration of this, this trial? Uh, so like the, 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 yeah, the, the duration as it stands right now is that the, those that are in, enrolled in the trial will be followed for two years. Um, if the vaccine is licensed before that time, uh, the trial will be stopped and the placebos will be given the option to be given the vaccine. Okay, so it, it, it's quite possible that somebody given a placebo might not know until, you know, 20, late 2022? Yes. Okay. Um, and moving on, uh, this may, may be for the governor, maybe for Dr. Levine. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, many volunteer ambulance departments are having a hard time filling their ranks, uh, getting the volunteers and, and employees needed to, to fill shifts, sometimes leaving unused ambulances at the station uh, while people are calling for 911 and, and having to have ambulances respond from farther away. Um, I know early on in the pandemic, the, the state changed some of their policies to uh, hopefully alleviate some issues. Um, I'm wondering if the state, uh, particularly the health department, is looking at any other um, policy changes that may help. Uh, and, and maybe a question for the governor, is this something that the National Guard can be tapped to assist with? Um, I'm not uh, aware of the situation, Greg, but uh, this might be a better question for Commissioner Sherling if he's on, if he's aware of anything uh, that, uh, that might I, uh, Excuse me, I am on, Governor. Um, we are aware of the uh, staffing challenges across all public safety uh, on uh, in emergency medical services, fire service, and in policing. Um, not sh we have not heard of any acute shortages, um, but this is an ongoing challenge that we had begun to address just prior to the pandemic with uh, a, a multi uh, pronged uh, approach to work on recruitment across all of public safety rather than uh, focusing on it in any one arena a uh, one at a time. Um, so uh, again, without specificity of any acuity related to the problem, we're aware generally of, of the issue. And I do know that, uh, uh, as you alluded to, the health department has made uh, some licensing uh, alterations to allow folks who are recently licensed to reobtain their license and to uh, recognize licenses from uh, from other jurisdictions uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, but if you have additional granular information and want to pass that along, um, happy to get that into the hands of uh, the folks at 
emergency medical services. Okay, um, I may be in touch later today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Aaron Patanko, VT Digger. The uh, school data total. Um, your um, your slides seem to say that there are six cases connected to the Montpelier outbreak in schools, and I had thought that that was for Union Elementary School, um, those six cases. But when you look at today's Department of Health report, it only lists three cases, two of which are within the past seven days. How many cases are there in total for the Montpelier outbreak? Principal, sorry. I'm either looking for Dr. Levine or Commissioner Beecher. I think we can put that slide back up. Mm -hmm. um, the slide of slide eight. Any clue why there's the sorry, go ahead. Sorry, we're trying to find the, the, the slide to go along with what Dr. Lynn's about to Okay, uh, say. Well, uh, while you're looking for that, do you have any idea of why there could be a discrepancy between your report and the Department of Health data that came out today? So on this slide, we have the counts of people who are at their school or place of work while infectious. And you can see we have school A, six. We have school C, E, uh, one apiece. So again, we, we look at these as people who are infectious at the time they're in the setting. We do have a number of times when someone calls the school and says, I, uh, I need to let you know that I'm positive. I just tested positive, uh, but they actually were not present in the school setting during the time they're infectious. So they don't get included in that count necessarily, even though they impact the school. Okay, so, so you're saying that your slides include all cases connected to the school where it's Department of Health only is once they're in the building, the, you know, the weekly, Cool. This, slide is, this, this slide is purely regarding um, who has been exposed at the time we're assessing the outbreak. This has nothing to do with the total numbers Commissioner Pichak put up for schools in Vermont as compared to other states, which goes beyond this outbreak. Uh, yeah, no, I was I was referring to the uh, you know same PDF that the Department of Health puts out the school by school data, which only reports two current cases at Union Elementary School. Yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that because I'm not seeing that report in front of me right now. Okay, um, with the with the school cases, is there anything we've learned recently about how transmission is happening? Sure. Um, you know, whether no. it's happening in school, at a specific place in school, yeah. With the exception of the one school um, where we had reported previously that that was our example of transmission within a school, uh, the majority of these schools, there is no transmission within the school. The schools are quarantining those appropriately who uh, we give guidance need to be quarantined. And when other cases develop, it's usually household contacts of the people who were the cases originally, as opposed to a transmission to somebody within the school. Uh, and as I made in my, as I said in my original comments, uh, the majority of cases are actually in the adult population more than the uh, student population. And um, when and if schools decide to operate remotely or have a class operate remotely. Um, they're doing that out of, out of uh, caution and they're also doing that sometimes pragmatically because of staffing concerns related to the adults who can no longer be in the school setting. Okay, um, I'm gonna 
But I, you know, I do think our experience has been very positive, even with an outbreak occurring. Uh, by and large, when you look at the numbers of schools in the state and the numbers that have been impacted, and the small numbers per school that have been impacted, I'd say we've done very, very well, and the majority of our students have been able to maintain the hybrid or whatever degree of in-person learning uh, their district was able to pull off in their, in their situation. Thank you. Kat, WCAX. I have a question is for um, probably Dr. Patrick. The study, how long do you have to enroll people in it? Um, pardon me, Kirk Patrick, I totally said your name wrong. Uh, how long do you have to enroll people in the study and is there a deadline? Uh, thanks for the question. We don't have a lot of time. Um, the study should be completely enrolled within six to eight weeks. Um, this is, again, as I mentioned, a national study with at least 80 other sites. And um, our window for closing will uh, end when the entire 30,000 person cohort is uh, dosed. Uh, and the expectation is that'll take um, between six and eight weeks. So we do expect that all of our uh, subjects will be enrolled by the holiday, by the winter holidays. And just because I know we're going to get questions here after this, it's, you mentioned there were specific groups that you were you were looking for, perhaps more than others. Does that mean other people who are interested should consider, you know, waiting to apply and seeing if the study fills up, or should anybody who is interested apply right off the bat? Uh, the best thing to do is uh, to go on the UVM Medical Center uh, website. There's a pre-screening uh, questionnaire that's hyperlinked there. And it can help, uh, if you go on and fill it out as an individual, it can help you identify if you're eligible or not. So the best thing to do is start with that. And if you're uh, eligible, then the staff team, the study team will actually call you back. So that's uh, probably the best place to start. Perfect, that's what we'll tell people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Wilson, EAP. Uh, hi, morning everybody. I have two related questions, but I can ask them both at the same time. Dr. Levine, the, the Central Vermont Hockey outbreak, if you will, have you identified an index case for that? And if there is a single index case, do you know where, how that person became infected? I mean, was that in state or from who knows where? And secondly, for the governor, governor is, as we've talked about already today, it's a week out from the, uh, from the election. And how do you think your campaign is going? And, uh, you know, are you confident, or how confident are you that you'll be back there in uh, whatever day of January is the inauguration? I'll answer my question quickly first. Uh, it's so challenging in many of these outbreaks to actually be able to identify the index case. And we often become aware of cases simultaneously, and it's very hard to trace back which was first and which may have infected the other. So that's why when I present the competing hypotheses, uh, any of which could be true, they account for the cases that we're aware of. So I can't give you uh, the one case and say this was one definitely related to travel versus related to a social gathering. But we believe all are implicated um, and um, the social gathering being the most glaring example. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Wilson, um, you know, the pandemic has come first uh, for me, first and foremost, uh, has been for the last seven or eight months. Um, secondary to that has been making sure that I'm doing my job, my other job, which is making sure leaving uh, the state in terms of uh, government and uh, the, the wheels of government continue to turn. Uh, so there are always challenges every day associated with that. Uh, the campaign really comes way down at the bottom of the list. Uh, we've done a pretty good job, I think, thus far. We'll know a lot more in about eight days uh, as to whether we did a good enough job. Uh, but, um, but suffice it to say, we've, uh, we've done all we can during these unusual times. Um, okay, great. That's it. Thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. On the hockey outbreak, it's my understanding that it was a known case by a parent and 
that um, there was prevaricating on the form to fill out uh, to bring the student here to Vermont, and that there was a social gathering by that parent afterward with the people. And I was wondering if you were Dr. Levine could confirm that information, and if, what would be the follow-up if, if that were the case, that someone was actually uh, willfully not following the guidance? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I do believe that it had to do with some sort of social event surrounding the off-ice uh, type of uh, um, gathering of some sort. Yeah. And uh, in the contact tracing, the Vermont Department of Health has not followed, uh, has not found that kind of uh, mobile behavior. Yeah, we, we cannot confirm uh, the precision with which you've delivered the news here today. Uh, we do not have that precise information. But we do have enough that information climate. surrounding the events, for sure. It, would, there, would there be any, um, I'm sure it would, in criminal activity, but uh, what, what kind of um, um, action would, the, would or could the state Yeah, uh, I, I should leave that to Commissioner Sherling. We have not actually implemented enforcement activities regarding people's quarantine behavior to this to this date. I do know that um, there are opportunities for um, the teams and their their status, if you will, their standing uh, with the. Uh, Memorial Civic Center obviously are at stake, but in terms of the state actually having an enforcement arm regarding quarantine, the answer is uh, we have not chosen to do that, and we've looked more for uh, education, guidance, and cooperation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, I, I just might want to add as well, you know, any outbreak that we've had thus far, um, when we look back uh, through history, whether it's the Winooski outbreak or the one at the orchards and so forth and so on, um, we, we look at those as, you know, learning opportunities as well. I think in this particular case, and we'll show on Friday uh, just the extent uh, of the outbreak and how it somewhat we feel has started, um, but I think it's due to, again, letting our guard down, becoming a little bit lax in, in how we approach things. And, uh, and taken for granted uh, that we're somehow immune because we've done really well here in Vermont. And, uh, and, I, and I think we, in some respects, are suffering from that at this point in time because think, people think it's normal. Well, we, it isn't normal. We still have a pandemic we're dealing with right now. We can't let our guard down. We have to make sure we wear our masks. We have to make sure that when we attend events that everyone is following the guidelines and know what you're getting yourself into, and it's the risks associated with that. So if you don't have to take the risk, don't. Uh, we still have, you know, months to go uh, with this uh, with this pandemic, and it's more critical than ever uh, with the winter months coming in, colder temperatures, getting inside, that we adhere to the simple, simple guidance that we've uh, outlaid. And uh, and again, I can't overstate the importance of some self responsibility here. And uh, so this is a learning moment for us, uh, but, you know, to, um, with other uh, f facilities, the facility itself appears to have done everything right. And uh, it was really the social aspect outside the rink uh, where the problem was, um, was started. Thank you, Governor. Avery, WCAS. Uh, Dr. Levine, we've been hearing that the uh, pharmacies testing has been quite busy with the demand for them. Um, is there any uh, new partnerships in the work between private pharmacies and uh, the state on testing? Yeah, thanks for that. There are no uh, new partnerships in the works, although we have a pretty abundant network currently. Um, and we're also going to have to observe the impact of what the federal government said regarding testing long-term care facilities 
and their partnership with uh, two of the national firms as well, national pharmacies. Uh, so um, we'd like to continue to expand what we have. Uh, and sometimes that might just mean one of the pharmacies extending the number of days per week, the number of hours each day they test, things of that sort. Um, I can say my own experience in talking with some have been that uh, when there's a, a need, um, they're willing to step up to the plate. So we would hope that they could continue that. Thank you. Joseph, the Barton Chronicle. I am not sure who gets this question, but um, recently the um, Ribby Elementary School sent a letter home saying um, that a member of the school community had tested positive for COVID. Um, the school has, um, it, it, did, it didn't hold classes yesterday and has moved to online completely. And my questions are, number one, is there any reason, as far as you know, to think that it is more than one individual? Um, and secondly, is the move to um, go to all online education for a week at least um, something that's required by the Department of Health, or is this a case of someone taking maximum precautions. Was this the, which school did you say this was, Jim? Derby Elementary, Derby. up in Derby Line. Yeah, to our knowledge, there was uh, one positive case. And obviously, as I've said here many times, the number of contacts per case um, in October of this year is much greater than it was earlier this year. So there are clearly contacts associated with that case, but that doesn't mean any of them will become cases. Um, because there are students and staff who are contacts, uh, the school made its decision regarding uh, what to do with their education beyond that. Public health always gives advice um, but at the same time, it's always a conversation and a discussion amongst public health, the agency on education, the local school officials uh, to come to the right conclusion for that setting. And there are t plenty of times when public health counsel is to continue school in session, but because of staffing considerations or other logistical considerations, the school district chooses to uh, either close a portion of the school or close the school for a period of time and go remote. And we completely respect that. Uh, but there's uh, not been a situation I'm aware of where the health department has actually said uh, to be much more stringent than the school already was planning to be. It's usually the opposite. Thank you. Uh, I had one other question, and this may be for Commissioner Pichek. Um I was looking at data point two, and I am not entirely sure how to um, interpret the chart. And what I'm really curious about is um, what is the R value? What is the effective reproductive rate at this point? I'm not sure how to interpret the chart that way. Uh, thank you, Joe. So you're talking about the one on page 19? Uh, yes. So what's depicted is uh, on the graph is simply the growth rate. There, the R uh, T rate is not depicted on the graph. Um, it um, is just showing the, the uh, I think, the three and the seven day growth rates um, on the visual. And the RT is that reproduction rate, you know, over time. And we were saying that if it gets to a um, certain point, Generally, we were thinking 1.1 or higher. That would sort of be something that would give us, you know, pause for concern. 
Um, and our RT rate has, you know, fluctuated as low, you know, well below one to, to just over one, you know, depending on the particular, um, you know, depending on how many cases we have and, and what's sort of going on in our case counts. So um, the RT value, I can get back to you on what it is specifically today, but the reason you're not seeing it is because it's not depicted in that slide. Lisa Scagliotti. Good morning. Um, I have a couple questions that are back at the Waterbury question that Lisa Loomis has raised earlier. Um, I think it might have been uh, a story that I had that was discussed in the American Legion cases that I wanted to point out that the folks at the, the Legion said that they closed on Thursday for a week because of two cases where the individuals were exposed but not um, not from an, another individual at the Legion, but from another location. So maybe that's why it's not popping up as being connected to the Legion itself. Um, so they, and they, they, may, so they were doing this out of an abundance of caution. So they may not have been positive themselves. Is that true? You're saying, Lisa, they were just well, they're, exposed? No, they were positive. Two people tested positive, but they say that their exposure did not come from another person at the American Legion, but from okay. someone somewhere else. But they are individuals who go to the Legion and presumably have other contacts with people there. So the Legion wanted to close for a week to just make sure that there wasn't additional um, spread happening among other members of the Legion. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a chance of being able to see if there's additional data that would show any growth in cases just in the Waterbury and Duxbury area in general before we see the map that comes out on Friday. Secretary Smith. Thank you for clarifying that. In the interim, I was uh, getting clarification, too. The cases may be, as you said, Lisa, the cases may be among people who are members of the American Legion. As of yesterday, the American Legion itself uh, is not the focus of, the, of any sort of a, a EPI investigation. Also note that anyone who may be affected or a close contact will be reached by the contact tracing team out of that. Can, can you repeat your specific question, and we'll probably take it um, and see what we can do with, with that question in terms of data that you need? Sure. I just was wondering if you see any increase in cases in general in the Waterbury and Duxbury area. Normally, we see the town-by-town -town information comes out and gets posted on Friday that's sort of current through the Wednesday of that week. Um, so I'm just wondering if, in general, we're seeing more cases popping up that might be in the community um, in general in addition to, you know, in connection, not connection, but sort of like at the same time as we're seeing these cases that were associated with Legion. Yeah, I, um, I'm hesitant to say something off the top of my head. I, I don't recall anything that strikes me as unusual in that area. Um, but let me uh, sort of research the data and get back to you before I, uh, before I, before you take that to the bank. Thank you. And I have one other question that I want to keep as hypothetical as possible to not sort of identify anyone in a uh, sort of hearsay kind of situation. But I'm wondering, kind of tied to what Dr. Levine said last week about people getting COVID fatigue, um, there's concern that I'm hearing in our community be about, about people who may be positive not staying home um, and not being isolated from the community, but being out and about. Um, there's, I've been hearing concern among people who say that they they believe that people who have tested positive are out and they're in local businesses. And I'm wondering what what is, does a business manager or owner, what kind of obligation is, is there upon them if they find themselves in a situation where a worker comes up to them and says, I know these people that were just here and I'm pretty sure that they're positive and they were just in our our store or a restaurant or whatever, in interacting with the staff and interacting while they're there. Um, there's a sort of a, a, a little bit of that happening right now, and people are, are scared and they're concerned and they are afraid to go to work. Um, so how, does, how is that supposed to get addressed, I suppose, in a, in a business where they haven't been contacted officially by any contact tracer? And the, the answer seems to be we just wait to see if someone gets sick. Yeah, Lisa, in that situation, and you, you are absolutely right. I mean, that is a very serious uh, situation. If somebody has 
tested positive, of, of course, we, we don't want, you know, we, we, we don't want a confrontation on this. The best advice I would give is to contact the health department in this case, um, and then let the health department follow up with that particular individual, uh, both on an education-wise and just to make sure um, during the infectious period that person isn't infecting other people as well. Okay, thank you. Courtney Kramer. Hi, good morning. My question is for Governor Scott. Governor, I'm wondering if you have um, a comment or what your reaction is to the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, I was vocal um, early on that I didn't believe that this should be something the Senate should be taking up at this point in time. Um, I remain concerned about that and based on the precedent that was set four years ago, I just think it's the wrong approach. But as far as the uh, qualifications of uh, now uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice, um, you know, it's, it's done at this point. Uh, but again, I think it's unfortunate uh, that it came to this, uh, this point. Okay, thank you, Governor. Andrew McGregor. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, this is for Commissioner Pisiak. Um I'm struck by the revised forecast that shows a tripling of the projected cases over the next month. How much of that is a foregone conclusion in the sense that the exposures have already occurred and that we're just waiting for the symptoms and testing to reflect that fact? Um, and last week you said the modeling has more granular projections, I think maybe based on county. Does the new modeling predict uh, this increase in cases will be distributed around the state, or are they um, uh, focused in any particular area? Yeah, good. Both of those are, are good questions. And on the first point, you know, it's it's 100 percent in our hands what the trajectory of that forecast is. Um, we presented forecasts previously in, in March and April that showed, you know, not just cases but hospitalizations really going up to a pretty significant and severe level. And with policy. Um, uh, policies being implemented and Vermonters following those and following health guidance, we quickly saw cases stop on a dime and go down and stay very low, you know, since the summertime. So the forecasts are not a foregone conclusion. Those are trends based on current cases and they will um, reflect what our behavior is going forward. So, you know, we 100% have the ability to control what that ultimate um, reality is. And, um, you know, by following public health guidance, we can make it. Uh, much a much lower reality than what's forecasted. In terms of your second uh, question about regional data, we definitely have you know information. We look at it on a county by county basis. We can um, include something uh, in next week's presentation. I just want to make again the caveat that when you're talking about you know data, even at the Vermont level where we're a small state, um, you know there's there, we have reliability in it because you know of the statewide population, but. When you get down to a county by county forecast approach, it just becomes less reliable because of the, you know, the less data that's available. So some counties in Vermont only have, you know, half a dozen cases maybe reported recently, which makes it difficult to trend out in the in the future. But I will say just generally that um, there's not a particular, you know, there's some counties that maybe you would anticipate that we'll see see a, a forecasted increase uh, more than others, like Chittenden County, where there's more population, and Washington County, where a lot of cases have been recently. But other than that, it's, uh, you know, relatively spread out through the state. So uh, with good luck and good adherence, do you think that the forecast by next week would uh, reflect a shift in that uh, uh, trickling by uh, Thanksgiving? Or, I mean, uh, my understanding with modeling and forecasting is with more data uh, comes more accuracy. So how, uh, how confident are you in the forecasting at, at this point? I mean, I, Noting that you said we do have to change. Yeah, exactly. Good question. So I, I mentioned, you know, that the forecast that we were on, you know, on, on October 21st, you know, just six days ago, was markedly different than the one that's forecasted for today. So if we can have the forecast change that dramatically in the negative direction in six days, we certainly have the ability to control it, change our behavior, and see um, a decrease in cases within that same time frame, and see an improvement uh, in that forecast. So. Uh, we'll wait and wait and see what happens, but like I said, Vermonters have always done a really solid job of responding 
to the public health guidelines that are coming out uh, and um, adhering to them. Um, uh, I guess the uh, last question that's still on topic, uh, if that forecast becomes reality, what are the, um, what are the consequences uh, that you envision in terms of hospitalizations and, and things like that? Yeah, so, I mean, as it relates to, to hospitalizations and, and, and fatalities, you know, that's why we included the slides today to make it clear that, you know, we are not seeing any real marked increase in those two important factors. That was not the case back in the spring when, you know, we saw obviously a really rapid rise in cases and pretty shortly thereafter a pretty substantial rise in hospitalizations as well. So, you know, we don't forecast that in the near term. Um, and uh, we'll wait and see what the actual forecast is, but we anticipate that you know we will get this um, under control before we have those kind of issues. Thank you. Go ahead, Paige. If I could just go back uh, just for a second to that question, and just um, to put this in perspective again, we had three hospitalizations yesterday statewide, so we're we're in pretty good shape. Sorry about that. Guy Page. Uh, Governor, this is for you or Secretary Condo, so I gather it's available by video. Uh, He's the changes not. made earlier this month to add more voter information security to the My Voter page portal on the election website. Are you confident that Vermont voter information is safe from cyber theft? Yeah, um, Guy, that is a, a better question for him. I think he uh, he isn't on the call right now, but he did say he's having a press conference uh, availability tomorrow at 11, and you might want to uh, ask him that question tomorrow. Thank you. Um, uh, question for either you or, or Mike Smith. Uh, congratulations on the zero positive tests among over 2,000 inmates. Uh, given that you are considering allowing, uh, given that, are you considering allowing more inmate access to in-person volunteers and church programming? Uh, just remember, Guy, we did have a positive in uh, one of our facilities with a correctional officer, mm -hmm. so we're um, testing that facility, I think it's today or, or yesterday. Um, in terms of that facility. Um, we're going to be very, very cautious of how we open up our, back up our facilities in terms of visitation. And as I mentioned last time, um, it is, it's going to be a while uh, before we're fully open in terms of those visitation, um, the way that visitation was. Uh, before, so I would expect it, it, it's still going to be a while. Thank you, Steve Merrill. Steve, star six to unmute. Okay, we're going to move on to Ashley De Leon from St. Michael's. Can you hear me? Uh, go ahead, Steve. Hi, sorry. Um, uh, I got one for the doctor and, and one for the governor, if I may. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Levine, uh, when uh, I'd asked you about uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, about face on the mask usage, I went back and, and looked at the 60 Minutes interview and his exact words were it might make people feel a little better it might stop a droplet but it's not providing the protection that people think it is often there's unintended consequences fiddling with the mask touching their face and then he talked about saving them for health care workers i presume he was talking about the n95s but uh and he kept talking about schmutz <laughs> i guess that was his uh term for fomites but um, anyways, if the masks are, uh, are, are that important and touching them, uh, you know, uh, might endanger their usage, shouldn't the, uh, shouldn't masks be worn along with gloves to, uh, 
to stop the, uh, the spread of uh, fomites or you're getting them on your face or in your eyes, stuff like that? My answer to that, uh, I'm not trying to be uh, trite by any means, but we have enough trouble as a nation having compliance with masks. Let's not make it more complicated and add a glove dimension to it. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually saying that seriously. But let me make it, this a broader question so I can have a teachable moment about masks in general. Uh, because at a, at a pandemic pace, the literature on masking has evolved. And different than that early point in the pandemic that you just quoted, uh, masks actually have accumulated much more evidence basis for their efficacy. That's the first thing. Second thing is, um, it's now also recognized, of course, that there is some probably small but still real amount of aerosol transmission, not just large droplet transmission. And masks can help the wearer, not just the person that the wearer is in the room with. Thirdly, there's some emerging literature, and it's not final yet, but it's all in the same direction, showing that in places where masks have been mandated, and that can be not just state versus state, but within a state where certain counties have mandated and others have not, or certain towns have mandated and others have not, there's evidence that um, the mask has produced uh, improvement in rates of infection. And I guess lastly, the other point is that masks are now being associated with, if you will, with a lower burden of virus, so that if you happen to still get the virus, even though you were wearing a mask, it's thought that the infectious load that you get and the illness that you'll subsequently suffer because of that will be milder because of wearing the mask. So I can't again reemphasize a hundred times how important masks are and how all the data is going in the same direction in a very positive way. I'll let you ask the governor. I don't mean, you know, I don't mean like you know, like mass mandates, uh, but I, uh, but people who are worried for their own protection, wooden clubs be, uh, yeah, and, and if be, they, be it, better for Yeah, if they chose to do that, I could certainly uh, endorse that completely. Um, but I, I, again, wouldn't want to make that a uh, requirement for people when the mask itself is really the critical ingredient. Um, make sure that people use sure. sanitizer all the time and wash their hands, like we've been saying, as part of the core guidance. Wash your hands all throughout the day and use sanitizer when you can't. I'll let you ask the governor his question now. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, thanks, Governor. Um, I, when I asked you about the PCB standards uh, over at BHS, um, you said it wasn't up to Dr. Levine or your administration to change the standards but the legislature, because they established it to begin with. <clears throat> but, um, and we mentioned the pilot test that was done eight years ago. Uh, but the question I have today is, uh, uh, are in, in, in the test before didn't single out our, uh, the schools that were built uh, in the 60s on a priority basis. Um, are, are you planning to test the uh, schools built in that time frame? on a priority basis. And number two, um, would you have the stricter Vermont standard uh, review on a scientific basis and use your executive order power to, uh, say, temporarily rescind the standard yeah. until the legislature could deal with it? First of all, I, w I would not use the executive power uh, to rescind uh, the PCB standard at this point in time. Uh, I think this is a, a legislature uh, type of initiative, um, and I'm sure it will be reviewed uh, based on the case we have in Burlington. But we know PCBs are uh, cancer-causing, and uh, there was a reason for this low standard. Uh, second, uh, I think the first part of the question was whether we'd be testing schools. Well, obviously, we'd like to do that in the future. It's going to take resources in order to accomplish that. Uh, and then a plan. 
and uh, be happy to work with the legislature on that. Uh, but it's not a flip of the switch. It's not something that can be done overnight. And it certainly isn't uh, to the same level as like a lead testing uh, program that was multi-million dollars uh, uh, that was uh, put forth uh, to, to accomplish that. Uh, this is uh, much larger, uh, a large, larger scale than that. But, uh, but again, I look forward to, uh, to having this conversation with the legislature when they come back into session, if I'm still here. And that, yeah, and that's like in January, right? That's correct. Okay. Well, great. Uh, thank you both very much. Okay. Uh, moving back to you, Ashley from St. Michael's. Good afternoon, Governor. I have a question for you and two follow-up questions for Mark Levine. With just over 1,400 students living at St. Michael's College, there are 30 in isolation and 160 in quarantine. The student body wants to know, how many is too many? What would it take for a semester shutdown? That's something that we would have to discuss with the uh, with St. Michael's. Actually, it's probably their decision at this point in time. Um, we've been working alongside them, um, but I would say some of the things we've been talking about today apply to the campus. Uh, you know, just make sure that you're following the guidelines. Uh, know who you're gathering with. Uh, wash your hands. Wear a mask. Uh, don't take any unnecessary risks, and uh, and you should be fine. Uh, putting people in quarantine at this point in time, shutting down, uh, locking down the campus, uh, should uh, help us get through this and help St. Mike's get through this. So uh, I'm confident um, that if everyone just uh, uh, adheres again to the guidelines put into place, uh, that we'll come out of this safely. Gibbs, a question for Dr. Thank Levine you. as well. Yes, I have two follow-ups for Mark Levine. So would you suggest that all students be tested every week going forward and throughout the spring semester? Certainly, we plan on testing every week going forward. Um, and I'm not sure about the f spring semester yet. That's a, a bit further in the future. But yes. Thank you. And one last question. Would it be feasible for the state of Vermont to provide flu shots for college students? College students should be able to access flu shots uh, without the state necessarily providing that and all have health insurance and um, could work with your health center there as well. Uh, and if you desired, could go to pharmacies and other clinical settings. So I'm not sure there's a, a need for the state to intervene in that regard. I would like to add one more line to my first answer though. Uh, because I know some of the news stories that have come out have um, maybe not intentionally, but unintentionally stated that testing a third of the student body at a time um, might be responsible for what's happened. And again, testing is not prevention. Testing just detects disease when we need to find it. It's all of the uh, preventive behaviors that we tell everybody to put into play all the time that determines if there's going to be a case or even an outbreak. So I wouldn't really point any fingers at the testing protocol that was being used. The good news is, unlike the majority of colleges around the country, there was testing going on at St. Mike's. It was an early sentinel warning system for us, if you will, on this outbreak because many of the students had no symptoms and wouldn't otherwise have sought uh, testing. So uh, I think the systems have worked, uh, and I want to emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you. Derek, seven days. Yeah, I have two questions related to uh, uh, out-of-state travel. Uh, the first is, uh, given the dramatically shrinking travel map, is the state planning to do more to broadcast from on prescriptions to would-be travelers or impose penalties or otherwise improve compliance? Well, again, we want to uh, step up our approach to this. Uh, we, um, we may be looking at uh, areas and, and um, maybe strategies uh, to make sure that people are adhering to the guidelines we have into place. 
uh, we do, I, I think we have um, the travel map uh, that we put into place every single week is on uh, uh, DFRs, uh, ACCDs, uh, uh, the health departments, uh, all of the websites. Um, so we're trying to communicate that uh, the best we can. And what we've seen is that uh, many people do uh, uh, look at the the, uh, the modeling on a weekly basis, as well as uh, count on each and every one of you in the media uh, to um, communicate that uh, to listeners so that everyone is aware, uh, because that's the only way this is going to work. If we, uh, if we continue to show that there's problem areas that are starting to uh, migrate into Vermont, um, that's where we have to put up this line of defense. That's why we put the program in place to begin with, uh, so that people were aware of uh, what's happening. Yeah, are there any are there any specific uh, steps that, that could be under consideration? Or, you know, other tools you may have to, um, to hammer the phone? Well, again, uh, we're uh, taking all the approaches we think we need to take at this point, um, but uh, but we may uh, have to go back into the field, so to speak, and make sure that uh, lodging facilities and restaurants and so forth are complying and, and taking uh, the information that we ask them to and uh, and then researching that to make sure that there's compliance. Mr. Pichek might have something to add to this. Uh, just on the point about education, uh, we mentioned this previously, but you know, when we look at how many interactions there are with the travel map, generally within any given 30 day period, there's about 1.3 million interactions so there is really significant you know um, uh, interaction with that map i think there's widespread knowledge of it both obviously from vermonters and those traveling to vermont as well uh, my, my follow-up question was related to um, lodging compliance i spoke with a hotel clerk who uh, was currently directed by management not to question guests about their travel history or quarantine uh, compliance just to simply ask them to sign the proof of compliance form. Uh, I'm wondering if you think uh, that approach is a problem. Well, again, that's why I mentioned that we may go back out in the field and and check uh, to make sure that there is uh, compliance as we requested. So that's one of the strategies that's on the table at this point. My understanding is that the, the, that approach currently that meets the guidance as long as the hotel has the, has these forms on file that they are in they are in compliance. I'm, I'm wondering if you think that's enough. Well, again, you know, it's one of the strategies that's on the table, uh, trying to go in and uh, actually dig in just a little bit deeper uh, to make sure that there is compliance with that certification. All right, thank you. Pete Hirschfeld, DPR. Governor, uh, EPR got an inquiry from a listener uh, looking for a status update on your voluntary pay and the fee program. It's been many months since you uh, put out the RFP to insurance companies looking for prospective bidders on that. Um, hoping you can tell us where that stands. Yeah, it's uh, been in limbo in a lot of respects, uh, Pete, because of the pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, the timing wasn't on our side. Uh, we hope uh, that once we emerge out of this, that we'll put that back out uh, to bid uh, so that we can get uh, prospective insurance companies interested in that uh, in that method that we uh, we put out there for the RFP. And did you, res did you rescind the RFP or did you not get any responses? I believe, um, and I, I, should, I should check to be sure, I, I believe we received maybe one response, but I'm not positive of that. But I'll, let me get the information and make sure that we're, we're giving you the correct information. Um, but is it fair to say that uh, there will be no statewide voluntary paid family medical leave plan in Vermont until the pandemic has passed us by? I think it would be, um, yeah, it would be difficult uh, to put that into place at this point because, again, we have to uh, reissue the uh, RFP and then um, put it into place so it's it would take it would take some time to put that into place and you know we want to make sure that we're in a, a market that uh, gives us the the best price and and everything that we ask for so 
Uh, it's, I don't believe it's right now, but, uh, but again, we're, uh, we're going to be exploring that. We haven't given up on the idea, if that's what you're getting at. I guess I'm just wondering, is it, is it lack of bandwidth to take on an initiative of that size, given all you have going on with the pandemic, or is it uh, a matter of fiscal concern that's compelling you to put this on hold? I think it's, uh, it's a matter of this worldwide pandemic, and, and I'm not sure that anyone is, is at this point uh, willing to bid on something that's so new. Uh, considering what the environment we're in. So I think it's due to the pandemic. Thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, BT Digger. Um, hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, Governor, just a quick one first about the revenues. I'm wondering, um, do you know why they came in well above what has been expected in the month of September? Yeah, you know, they, uh, they came in strong uh, and uh, in a lot of respects exceeded our expectations. Uh, this just shows the volatility uh, that we have in the economy. Um, we feel uh, that a lot of it's due, been due uh, to the, to the uh, billion dollars that's been injected into the economy uh, in whether it's the POAs or unemployment, the extra $600, uh, and we've seen the the ripple effect of that uh, throughout uh, the entire economy. So um, there's a lot of areas, uh, whether it's real estate, uh, whether it's uh, outdoor recreation equipment, uh, there are some good news out there in some respects, uh, but a lot of it I think was due, uh, from my standpoint, uh, due to uh, the injection of so much uh, federal money into the, our economy, which tells me uh, we're going to need another um, uh, another shot of that to get through this uh, as we see the light at the end of the tunnel. All right, thanks. And the other question is about um, the Department of Labor. I'm wondering if the state or if you are reconsidering how things are being managed there, because as you probably have heard, I've been hearing, I know all the journalists have, there have been numerous problems in getting unemployment relief, this recent round of unemployment relief out to people who have lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19, and I guess the DOL has been telling callers that an outside vendor is handling the latest relief checks. I'm talking about the $300 supplemental checks that are coming in those two batches to cover August and the first half of September. Callers are hearing um, from the call answers that um, they'll hear back from the DOL and they never will, and the people who answer the phones are also saying they can't give out any information because they don't have it. It's all in the hands of an outside vendor. Even top officials at the Department of Labor who I've asked about things like, you know, how many people have you asked for refunds and questions like that, say it's being handled by an outside vendor and they can't tell me. And I'm just wondering what's going on there and, you know, we're now seven months into this and they really have a lot of money and a lot of things to figure out in it too, but are you taking any steps now to, to change the way things are being handled there? Yeah, uh, again, and, you know, let's, let's take a step back and see where we've come had 90,000 people on unemployment almost overnight. Um, we've been able to work through that. Uh, there's been supplemental income. We had to set up a PUA system, something brand new, never been done before on top of the traditional unemployment. And then on top of that, when this, the extra money ran out, the extra $600, uh, uh, the administration, President Trump came forward with an idea uh, to come up with $300 of FEMA money that had to be matched, and then another new program had to be set up. I mean, this is so unusual and overwhelming when you think about uh, the, the capacity of any department. Uh, you know, we've, we've reacted uh, with uh, having uh, interconnections with uh, the Department of Financial Regulation, the Department of Motor Vehicle, uh, every entity trying to help out in some way. Um, but uh, but this is like, it was like a tsunami. Uh, this really did uh, impact us in a, uh, a dramatic way, uh, in every sense of the, of the word. We're doing uh, what we can. Obviously, uh, there are some shortcomings uh, that we try and uh, tackle almost each and every day, and we'll continue uh, to do that. Uh, but at this point in time, I have faith in uh, the leadership at Labor and we'll continue to identify the problems as they crop up. Um, but And they will continue to crop up because nothing is perfect. And on top of all that, um, we have a, an IT system that's 50 years old uh, that we've asked uh, for some help in 
previous years uh, to to replace, uh, but uh, but that hasn't been met, uh, and and people haven't been interested in uh, doing that. So, you know, we um, they have a lot on their uh, on their plate over at Labor, and uh, I thought they've um, we've had again some shortcomings. Uh, we've we've rectified that, uh, but uh, but they will continue uh, to be challenged as we. Uh, continue to work through this because we still have 22,000 people on some sort of unemployment assistance at this point, and that could increase uh, depending on what happens in the next uh, few months. But I mean, it's sort of an accounting question too at this point. If they don't know how much money they put out into the sent out to Vermonters that they're now going to be asking to get back, it's it's sort of like um, you're dealing with an accounting mystery that involves millions of. Yeah, and you're dealing with guidelines from the federal government uh, that make it even uh, more problematic. I mean, these aren't these are new guidelines that they keep issuing, uh, and continue uh, obstacles that are put in the place in, into place uh, that uh, have been very difficult to get through. Um, so, uh, this isn't the you know the standard unemployment that we've had for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, this is something brand new in in all different areas. So, I uh, I would say uh, that again, uh, there's a lot of uh, finger pointing uh, going on, uh, but the pandemic has led us uh, to the point where uh, this is uh, unusual, uncertain times, and and certainly uh, they're doing the best they can at labor. All righty, thank you so much. That's it. Well. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again on Friday.